Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Measurement of the Potential Exposure to Isocyanates, Monomers, and Oligomers During Spray Painting. I am Ed Rutkowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and special thanks to the Sotelco Division of Sigma Aldrich for sponsoring this webinar. Sigma Aldrich researches, manufactures, and supplies chromatography columns and related tools for environmental, government, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical, and chemical laboratories. Sigma Aldrich specializes in four main product areas, gas chromatography packing columns and accessories, liquid chromatography packing columns and accessories, sample preparation products, and chemical reference standards and reagents. Our presenter today is Gary Oishi. Gary is an R&D chemist in the Environmental Air Monitoring Group of the Sepulco Division of Sigma Aldrich. He is involved with helping develop new products and testing methodologies in air monitoring. He previously spent over 20 years in analytical chemistry involved with the identification of micro and macro contaminations in failure analysis, deformulation, forensic, and industrial hygiene sample testing. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Gary. Thanks, Ed. And welcome to everybody who's uh, joining me for this presentation. I hope uh, we can all learn something from this. Um, today, as you guys already know, that we're going to be talking about the potential of exposures for isocyanates from monomers and oligomers. Um, to get started, oops, we'll kind of get a basic idea of what an isocyanate is. Um, as if, for those who don't know, isocyanates are the reactive component used in making polyurethane materials. Simple polyurethanes can be made by reacting an isocyanate in a polyol compound. Other forms of polyurethane materials can be created with active hydrogen-containing compounds, such as alcohols, carboxylic acids, and amines, yielding products with various characteristics. Um, isocyanates in the news, well, recently events related to isocyanates. Um, from, I'd say, we'll take a look from 2011, with the EPA establishing an action plan for MDI and TDI, and then moving from there to OSHA adding isocyanates to the National Emphasis Program, and more recently to the EPA's proposal limiting the use of TDI in consumer products. Um, so certainly it's been um, highlighted and is concern for a lot of people. Isocyanate exposure. Well, isocyanate exposure is universal. It's everywhere because polyurethanes are everywhere. Um, exposure levels vary by environment. Health risks associated with isocyanate exposure are numerous, from respiratory disorders such as asthma to chest and abdominal pains, reproductive issues, to even death from lethal exposure to the highly volatile isocyanate MIC or methyl isocyanate, um, which methyl isocyanate was used as a component in making an agricultural pesticide aldicarb, and there are several other pesticides that it's used in synthesizing. And was, this was released into the environment in Bhopal, India in 1984, which was probably one of the most uh, largest environmental exposure resulting in thousands of deaths, birth defects, and other deformities. Currently, some isocyanates are now being considered as cancer suspect agents. Um, we're talking about most of the um, aromatic type uh, monomers. Looking at what NIOSH has uh, in their pocket guide, uh, information about isocyanates, uh, specific compounds listed, as, as you see here, are only monomeric forms. Um, all other forms of isocyanates are not mentioned specifically, uh, except for the possibility of falling under the TRIG designation or the total reactive isocyanate group, but there's still no information or guidance as far as exposures go. And bringing up, you know, I bring up this point only to show you later on, um, this will become kind of in the presentation will become more evident as we, how important this could be. So let's look at some facts. Isocyanates are high, 
Oh, okay. Well, isocyanates are highly reactive. We know that. Widely used for creating polyurethane products with varying properties. This is evident in numerous applications throughout commercial use in foams, coatings, fibers, and elastomers. So again, depending on what um, you use as that active hydrogen compound can create different types of materials giving you these, all these different types of characteristics. And the most common interaction that everyone has had with polyurethane is in foam that can be found in furniture. Uh, I'm sure everybody's got furniture in their homes. And uh, another example is in the paint coatings on automobiles. But don't panic, these, you know, these are cured materials and it's only in the creation through reactive polymerization where there is a concern from exposure to monomers and oligomers. So why the concern? As we know, isocyanates are highly reactive, a powerful irritant and sensitizer to the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract, eyes, and skin. Exposures can develop into and manifest as occupational asthma, or even worse case, lead to death. The OSHA National Emphasis Program, NEP, for isocyanates lists in Appendix B only monomeric forms. However, oligomeric isocyanate species have also been shown to produce some respiratory issues. OEHHA, which is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, mentions in a 2015 draft that, quote, however, what these studies show is that TDI monomer and prepolymers share many of the same pulmonary effects, including inducing sensitization and occupational asthma with repeated exposure. This suggests some commonality in the mechanism of sensitization, possibly related to isocyanate binding carrier proteins, end quote. So how does exposure occur? Primarily, the, the possibility of exposure is created with the formation of urethane for application. Physical mixing and the exothermic nature of the reaction will produce gaseous and or aerosolized vapor with inhalation and contact pathways. In this presentation, the focus was during application. However, another possible exposure pathway could be from thermal degradation, which could release isocyanates. In addition to isocyanates, other contaminants could also be released, such as aldehydes, amines, and other volatile compounds. Currently, uh, let's look at how we actually analyze for isocyanates. There are numerous sampling approaches from liquid samplers that use impingers to dry type samplers and even combinations of the two. Each has their own pros and cons. In this presentation, we'll be looking at only two ty dry type samplers as this type is a commonly used platform. Here, it, these are what are available methods for using dry type sampling devices. And in this comparison, what we're gonna be taking a look at is the last two methods in the list, the OSHA 4247 um, and also the, using an ISO 17734 um, methodologies. So it, we'll take a look now at what was kind of like an overview of what the experiment was. Um, we used, and then for this case, we talk, this presentation is about spray painting, and in the spray painting application experiment, we used an automotive clear coat. Um, however, prior to the experiment, we took that clear coat components and we mixed and screen to determine which species of isocyanates should be the focus of subsequent analysis. And it was found that this particular clear coat contained 1,6-hexamethylene diisocyanate HDI and also isoferone diisocyanate IPDI. And it's always nice when chemistry confirms what is seen in industry because using this non-aromatic urethane um, definitely makes sense because uh, it won't yellow when exposed to light. Nobody likes, you know, a car that's coated with a nice clear coat, comes white, and then after a few years, 
it turns yellow and thinking, you know, that's, I didn't buy a yellow car. But anyways, um, painting, sp spraying, and sample collection were conducted for 15 minute intervals simultaneously. And both personal and area samples were collected. HPLC was used as the analytical finish. So nothing that was terribly unusual. So let's look at the, how or the details as far as what was conducted. The automotive clear coat that we used is commercially available and was recommended by a local auto body repair shop. The two components of the coating, clear coat and activator, were mixed together per the manufacturer's instructions and then thinned. A high volume, low pressure HVLP spray gun was used to apply the coating to a car hood in a ventilated spray booth as you can see in the picture. The hood that we, the car hood that we had to, that we used had to be purchased from a junkyard uh, only because we had no employees taking the free offer, one time offer of, you know, painting their hoods on their car. So uh, otherwise we would have probably, we could have probably conducted multiple tasks and that would have probably been nice. So the two type uh, samplers that were sampling medias that we comparing. Uh, we were looking at an Orbo 80, which is a 37 millimeter uh, cassette containing derivatizing agent uh, 1,2-PP or 1,2-parietyl propyrazine uh, coated on a glass fiber filter in accordance with uh, OSHA 4247. And on the right is an acid style filter configuration, which contains two glass fiber filters coated with the derivatizing agent agent uh, DBA or dibutylamine. And later we'll take a look at how these work as a possible key and, and how effective they are. Spray booth samples, uh, we, not only were two different sampling media compared, but two sample subtypes were examined, personal and area samples. And in the next slide I'll show you uh, how these were kind of laid out. Um, here is uh, a layout of where everything in the spray booth was located from a, kind of an overhead perspective. Uh, spray booth interior dimension is only seven foot tall, eight foot wide, and 11 foot deep. And the spray booth dimension and the basement location kind of limited what we painted. So uh, we couldn't fit a whole car in there, so we just had to settle for smaller pieces. Uh, ventilation in this uh, airflow in this, for the spray booth was at least 100 uh, feet per minute. And as you can see, the area samples were set up in the back of the spray booth, and the nice smiley face was our volunteer who did the spray painting. Um, again, sampling details for the two different types of samplers that were used. Um, these are what would commonly be used in industry um, for the filter cassette, for the Orbo 80, one liter per minute, as per OSHA 4247. Uh, for the personal sampling, Zep, we use Zephon Escort Elf pumps, uh, which are very common. Uh, for the area sampling, two four-channel R&D prototype sampling pumps were used. This was only because we had we're taking so many samples um, for the at the, at the same time, so it was kind of hard for us to have eight different sampling pumps for those. Uh, all asset samplers were calibrated using a BIOS uh, Definer 220, and for all the Orbo 80 samplers, uh, were, these were calibrated using an AP Buck M5. Again, sampling time for this test was 15 minutes. The Orbo 80 samplers, analysis was performed using uh, LCUV uh, following OSHA 4247 using the available 1,2-PP uh, derivatives of hexamethylene diisocyanate, HDI, methylene diphenyl isocyanate, MDI, and the two toluene diisocyanates, the TDI isomers, as standards. This is one of the resulting chromatograms from an area sampler. Um, all the Orbo 80 samples were not field-desorbed, as these were samples 
were immediately analyzed after collection, which occurred shortly after sampling. These were, since they were in the basement, there was a short walk upstairs and into the lab where they could be analyzed. So, not, I mean, sort of, kind of, quasi, field absorbed, but certainly within the same time frame. Um, in this chromatogram, as you can see, we did detect the presence of monomeric HDI, which correlates with the spray paint formulation. And uh, all the peaks detected after are unidentifiable based upon the method. So there's one peak that's labeled as unknown. However, out of my curiosity, I wanted to know what that unknown peak was. And, at, and this was actually later identified uh, using LCMS as the derivative of HDI isocyanurate. So um, that, and the other peaks further out from there, um, there wasn't enough information in order to get enough for positive identification. So those were left undue, but those could possibly be some other, other oligomers that could be have combined. Next, uh, here is a typical chromatogram of one of the acid area samples. The acid sampler analysis was performed uh, using LCMSMS method, um, using CRM standards that we have of the isocyanate DBA derivatives, along with deuterated internal standards. And here, as you will notice, uh, we do see the two monomers, HDI and IPDI, that were identified initially in the pre-screening of the clear coat system. You can also notice the presence of HDI and IPDI oligomers. Um, as, so that's kind of gives us a little bit more information. And, and this seeing the HDI isocyanurate in, in this asset also kind of corresponds with seeing it also after curious investigation from the Orbo 80 sample. So those two pieces of information kind of do match up. Um, here are the calibration standards or the materials that were used. Identification and quantification using the acid sampler was accomplished with the use of these the certified reference standards uh, compliant with ISO 17025 Guide 34. Not only were the monomers available, but oligomeric forms were also available to provide direct quantitation. Having the oligomers eliminates the, the estimation most methods base calculations upon. Um, and if for those people familiar with some of the uh, NIOSH or other methodologies out there, um, a lot of the oligomer quantitation is done based off of monomeric re responses. So having these oligomers as a direct comparison or reference does make a, and possibly can make a difference. Um, and, and at the bottom, again, for we have the sample uh, calibration standards for Orbo 80. Only derivatives of the monomers are available. Um, so looking at any of the oligomers in order to do quantitation by the, that technique would not make, uh, would just be an estimation at that point. Well, here's a photo showing the results of personal sampling that was done. Um, as you can see, the isocyanate oligomers, along with their concentrations collected on the acid samplers. Uh, the HDI and the IPDI monomer concentrations were below our detection limits. Uh, you'll notice that the concentrations found were higher, and in addition, two additional isocyanates were detected on the spray painter's left side. Um, if you remember, from the overhead diagram of the spray booth layout, this difference may have been caused by the booth airflow movement, which was from the painter's right to left. So uh, I, that could possibly be a big reason why um, we do see that difference. No isocyanates were detected um, in the Orbo 80 sampler, and unfortunately we didn't run uh, Orbo 80 on the on the painter's left side in order to see if we can see, pick up any HDI also there. But um, next we'll take a look at the area sample results. In this uh, comparison of the area samples, um, there's only four method identified detected compounds 
which would be the HDI using the Orbo 80 filter cassette. As we can see, there appears to be an underestimation for this monomer by the 1-2PP filter technique. And you can see how fairly consistent you know, we tried to keep the samples close to each other to get, you know, to minimize any effect of the ventilation flow. Uh, now we'll kind of look at uh, the results in a tabulated form. This kind of will highlight um, some of the important features or some of the, the key features of what has been found. The results of the, this, the asset area samplers, um, they're reported here. The analytes highlighted in yellow. Um, those are oligomeric forms as to oppose to the initially identified HDI and uh, IPDI monomers. Um, what is of particular interest here is that the high levels of oligomers compared to the monomers, and these are, uh, I have highlighted in red, so quite a bit of difference um, from the monomer to the oligomeric quanti quantities. And next here are area samples uh, results for the Orbo 80 filters. In comparison with the previous results table, um, there are no oligomeric isocyanates listed, and this is um, kind of based on because of the limitations of the analytical technique and having no commercially derivative standards available. Um, so how can we explain a possible reason for the underestimation of monomers found between these two dry type sampling techniques? For that, you know, we'll take a look at how these uh, sampler designs differ. Uh, one difference, we'll take a look at the acid sampler, it kind of shows you how different they, they were designed, was that most typical filters uh, place a particle filter before the vapor filter, as with, in the case our coated filter in the Orbo 80 cassette acts as kind of both particle and vapor collector. Well, in the acid sampler, um, we, this is kind of flipped around backwards, but uh, we have it so that the vapors are collected first and then the particles are collected afterwards. And, you know, people ask, well, you know, how does that make a difference? Um, well, the advantage of collecting the vapor first, uh, I'll show how that can be better illustrated in the next slide with, with actually some animation. So here, this will give you a better idea of what can occur and what is possibly occurring. Um, so I guess to work. Okay, so reagent depletion can occur with some isocyanate samplers, and this happens as analytes are not able to come in contact with the derivatization reagent coated on the filter. This is one reason, like OSHA has recently recommended, that field absorption of samplers be done immediately. Um, otherwise, those unreacted isocyanates would polymerize and not be able to derivatize, thus making your estimation or your quantitation report at a lower value. So next, uh, with the acid sampler, and having the vapor collection um, first before the particle collection, um, using a volatile derivatizing agent, DPA, what that does is that creates a refreshing of the derivatization reagent so as particles come through, they come in contact with the filter and are derivatized. Any particles that pile up on top of that are still going to be derivatized because they are, because the DBA maintains uh, a continual derivatization derivatizing atmosphere that provides better conversion of those particles. So you're not going to have that effect where piling on and not getting complete or complete conversion of all your of those compounds. So we found that the analytical methods can successfully reach the quantitation limit for most isocyanates of about 5 nanograms per mil in the final sample when LCMS MS is analyzed was used in the quantitation limit of 10 nanograms per mil when LCMS was used. These numbers 
can translate to about 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter and 0.4 micrograms per cubic meter in air if a 24-liter air sample was taken. Both the MS and the MS-MS analysis give reasonably low LOQ for the method, and all 11 compounds were well resolved chromographically using uh, standard uh, uh, C18 15 centimeter column. Um, having acceptable recoveries for the isocyanates demonstrates kind of like the overall efficient performance of the extraction and analytical method. So let's look at key differences um, between the two techniques that were employed. Having specific calibration standards allows for identification and quantification of analytes directly. Uh, LCMSMS allows for lower detection limits of higher and higher confidence in analyte identification. And we have just seen sampler design can help with better derivative, derivative conversion. Um, and here's, this is for the marketing people uh, who, have, who want to get more information. Uh, this is where information on the dry, on the sampler or the acid sampler can be found on our website. So I kind of like in conclusion, some important points that need to be recognized. Um, sampler design can play, have an important role in, in what results can be attained. Um, LCMS, uh, certainly able to give you the advantage of being able to identify and quantitate accurately using real, correct monomer and, and alertmeric derivative standards. Um, we saw that predominant airborne species of the ligamers were HDI isocyanurate and IPDI isocyanurate. And we also saw that the, there are definitely higher levels in comparison to monomer levels. This experiment kind of has shown that there can be higher potential for exposure when the ligamers are additionally tested for, as opposed to when using methods only, that's only only look for monomers. This may not be true for all applications, but you gotta bear in mind, the results of not looking for oligomers is very different as opposed to looking for them and not detecting any. So essentially in short, you know, can't, don't ignore the potential for, for oligomers. And I wanna thank everyone for uh, spending some time with me and hopefully you'll have learned, we'll all have learned something from this experience. Hey, thanks, Gary. Uh, it looks like we have a, a good bit of time for questions. And just a okay. reminder, if, uh, to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Um, we have a couple already. Um, one attendee asks, uh, since oligomer composition varies with each product, what quote unquote gold standard or other techniques does the lab use for quantitation of oligomer concentration? Well, again, that's very key. I mean, and that's very important as far as trying to determine, you know, and not all applications are gonna be the same. So dependent on what the potential is, which oligomers, which monomers are present, what kind of steer you towards which application or methodology would work the best. Now, everybody, you know, if you're, if you're kind of like old school, um, everybody kind of all, everybody kind of grew up with impingers. The new school is people have moved away from impingers, but if you're old school and like the impingers, um, impingers have be, you know, are kind of, there's kind of like almost no substitute for them, but yet they, they have their own kind of good points and bad points. Again, it's all dependent upon the style and what, and what kind of levels you expect to see. But as far as the screening goes, I would say, I mean, it's very hard unless there are specifics, you know, uh, you know I, it, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question exactly in that kind of, uh, just because it's, it, it's really dependent upon what things are gonna be tested for. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, yeah. Another 
another attendee had a couple of questions about the PPE that the worker was wearing in the picture you showed. Um, uh -huh. The questions are, was there concern with the painter's eyes or absorption? It looks like he was wearing safety glasses with a half mask. Why not full face or supplied air hood respirator? Or was the painter wearing goggles? Um, well, the painter was wearing face protection. Um, typically, as, and as you, you, as the personal air samples were, um, we weren't expecting to see sub substantial or any um, levels of kind of like detected just because of the, the airflow ventilation and the design of the, the flow, the spray booth. Um, we knew that it was going to be fairly low, especially with that kind of, it was a cross flow of ventilation. So from his, from his painters right to left, uh, and he was spray painting directly in front. So personal sample, personal exposure was going to be not very high, if, if any at all. And we didn't see anything to be very concerned about. Um, but later on in uh, some other testing that we did do, we actually did move them to uh, actually supplied air. So just to be more on the safe side. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh -huh. um, okay. Um, there's a question from Christine. Why were two acid samplers, two pairs, used for each sampling location compared to one Orbo 80? How were the two acid samplers prepared such that one analytical result was reported? Well, okay. Um, what we actually did another study within this study, and we were working on um, the analytical methodology as far as the prep goes for the samplers. The two acid samplers that were side by side were actually duplicates of each other, but one was used was prepared using the standard uh, methodology that we've got developed. But we were also looking at changing, doing some modification to that methodology um, because the extraction uses um, toluene. And we were trying to move away from toluene using that in the extraction procedure. So we actually were looking at using um, hexane to move it over to hexane. And that other acid sampler was set up to to go through a hexane extraction procedure. So that's why there were two. But we didn't uh, put that data in this, in this presentation. OK. Uh, there's a question from Leslie. What are the minimum and maximum sampling times? Um, minimum times, I mean, it could be short um, as far as I mean, yeah, typical, most samplers that are for ice cyanates, you know, you're, you're sampling uh, maximum like 15 minutes, but depending on the concentration you're looking for, it could be as short as 15 minutes, it could be as long as eight hours. So, um, and you have to remember we are looking at, uh, we have a lower flow rate for the acid sampler. Um, so capacity wise, you're definitely not gonna overload the filter. Uh, so you can run it for eight hours, you, and with having the way it refreshes itself, kind of makes it so you don't have, if there is high levels of any isocyanates present, it, you know, you don't get that piling on effect on that filter cassette, so you don't really need to, and that's why people only can really sample for a short period of time, is because once that isocyanate builds up, and especially if you're looking at, you know, maybe, you know, a faster reactive isocyanate, you can't let it sit by itself, otherwise it, you, you know, it's gonna polymerize and then you're not gonna be able to pick that up in the analytical method. So with the acid design, you can actually sample for a longer period of time. So you know, an eight hour shift is certainly you know, reasonable. Okay, um, question from Cindy. Does this meet NIOSH validation protocol? Um, well, NIOSH is looking at it. They have not um, approved of it yet. 
and they also don't, and one reason why is they don't have the analytical capability, they don't have um, an LCMS in their, in their hands, and that's, you know, the only kind of con about this whole technique is that most labs who are doing these types of analysis don't have LCMS, you know, in, in their facilities, um, but, you know, you know, we're just kind of giving them a reason maybe to buy one. Okay. Uh, this question from Dan. Um, he asks, what test method could provide data for the following question? How long after we stop robotic spraying can we go into a booth without a respirator? Well, is that, <laughs> I mean, you, you could ha actually do some sampling in order to, to determine that, but it, currently, I mean, if you think about what um, has been out in the public as far as, if you think about it in terms of um, commercial or consumer uh, applications, you know, spray painting and you know, spray painting in houses or spray foaming in houses, um, the recommendation is, you know, not to enter uh, within an hour after spray painting or spray foaming. So, you know, again, depending on the, it would kind of be dependent on what isocyanate is being used, you know, how fast reactive it is. Um, the faster reactive, probably the sooner you could probably go into an environment um, and not have to worry about, depending on your ventilation, the, air, the airflow turnover, um, you wouldn't have to worry about being exposed for and vapor, but you know, there's always that possibility for skin contact exposure. Um, for, but for fast reactives, those are going to react pretty fast, and you're not going to, you know, as opposed to a slower reactive like um, any of the aliphatic isocyanates, you may have, it may be a little bit longer before you can enter because those are, again, those are going to take longer to polymerize and still be uh, the, some of that free isocyanates will be available. So. Okay. Uh, Leslie asks, uh, what are the interferences with the Orbo 80 and the asset? Interferences? Uh, I don't know of any because um, they're all dervertization rea reactions, so they're going to be very specific. Um, you have for the Orbo. For the Orbo 80, I haven't seen any, uh, I mean, interferences, uh, I don't know if they're, the only thing that could interfere with it is anything that's going to have a reaction with the 1, 2 PP derivative. And then it's going to be based on retention time in the analytical run. but it, but that's going to be set by using calibration standards to determine what those retention times are. So unless you get um, something that creates a, a compound that has very similar retention on a column and methodology format, that uh, would be kind of hard to, um, to differentiate if, it, if they do overlap. Versus like the asset, I mean, with LCMS, I mean, you, you, at least you have MS plus you have the derivatives, the known derivatives, so you can see specifically what, how well they match, you know, whether they match or not, or whether, you know, the, the fragmentation gives you, you know, something else, and you're going, well, that doesn't look like the standard, so, you know, you could possibly, you could possibly attribute that to being as an interference, but again, uh, it, that's that to be a, a dicey road to go down. There's a question from Adam. Um, how close are you to validating the method for denuder sampling? Um, well, the method there there is a method that's currently being used. Uh, there are a number of labs who are currently performing the analytical technique. So um, we have, you know, uh, quite a few different area, industries that are using them and sending them off to labs that have validated their analytical technique or capabilities of using LCMS. 
Okay. Uh, Thomas asks, uh, will a safety data sheet, data sheet of a substance containing isocyanates detail testing methods to determine exposure limits? Uh, no. <laughs> That's up to the, that would be up to the, kind of like the manufacturer for, the, for because they're the ones who even peel out the SDS for that. And what's, you know, and again, with a lot of things, what we found is that manufacturers who make or create isocyanate products, what they've done is, then this is always a continuing growth as far as the product, the whole you know, isocyanate or urethane industry goes, is that they change the formulations on these in order to help limit exposure levels. So in the beginning, as, as everybody was aware that the main concerns for that science were all the monomers, um, uh, TDI, HDI, and those, because those were the most commonly used. But as time went along and people became more aware of exposure and concerns with those uh, monomers, um, formulations have changed to include or create or being made with um, polymers, pre-polymers, um, and what that does is that changes the molecular weight of those isocyanates. And changing the molecular weight of the isocyanates actually changes the, the chemical characteristic of them and making them less volatile. And having them less volatile and maybe changing how reactive they are can change the exposure levels. Now, with, with that kind of being said, you know, it's one of those ever-evolving um, cases, and a lot of times what you see in a product, there may not be, you know, you may not find any information on those isocyanates, but it doesn't mean that, you know, oligomers or whatever aren't being formed for possible exposures. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Ganesh, who I think is uh, listening in from abroad. He asks, how about shipping stability? Can they be sampled and sent to the U.S. for analysis? If it takes about oh, yes. three to five days. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's certainly not a problem. Um, our samplers or the acid samplers don't need any refrigeration. Um, so for storage, they don't need to be stored, uh, refrigerated, and also after sampling, um, they don't need to be field absorbed, um, and they don't need to be refrigerated for, for shipping. Okay. Uh, Adam asks, how many labs in the U.S. can perform the denuder analysis? How many labs? Well, we have quite a few, like, um, big global laboratories over, over, over 10. Maybe. Currently, there are probably over 10 labs that, that can perform the test or the analysis. But okay. I... I but if they want to know which one specifically, if they actually go onto our website, they can, we have the labs listed. Okay. Um, Eric asks, what were the personal exposure levels relative to the exposure limits? Uh, well, I'd have to go back and look, but I think they were lower than the exposure limits. Actually, I can go back here. Well, uh, looking at that slide, um, lower than exposure limits for, for the monomer, obviously, because we didn't detect any, but um, currently, I mean, there are no exposure limits for any of the oligomers. So that would be kind of a, a kind of a, a I, I can't say because <laughs> there, there is no exposure limit for any of the oligomers. Okay. Um, Jennifer asks, have you looked into comparing these with a single filter sampler? You wouldn't separate particulate and vapor, but you would get the total. Mm, 
Say that again. Sure. Um, have you looked into comparing these with a single filter sampler? You wouldn't separate particulate and vapor, but you would get the total. Separate, the, I mean, separate yeah. the two in a singular in a single sampler, such as I'm not sure I follow the question. Okay, I'll ask uh, if Jennifer is uh, still on uh, listening. If she could uh, provide a little more information, we'll try and get back to that question before the end. Or, before the top right, of the or hour. she could just yeah, right, she can send me an email. You know, we can chat back and forth to. Get, to you know, help her get her what she's looking for. Sure, sure. Um, Curtis asks, did you attempt to test any removal of polyurethane coatings during grinding operations with the levels of airborne particulate affect which method you would use? Um, well, that's, that's kind of, I mean, that's, you know, obviously beyond what this presentation was because that's more of a, degradation thermal effect, but that's, that's certainly a question that, you know, definitely is interesting because grinding and thermal degradation of the of any polymer, uh, depending on what kind of temperatures that are generated, really kind of determines how and what, how that urethane unzips or decomposes. So creating, so going back, you know, you're not going to go straight back to um, maybe the monomer that was used, um, you're going to get, you will get oligomeric or uh, more oligomeric forms, but again, temperature would definitely be very critical to that. Um, as far as trying to test for it, uh, it it's going to be one of those things where any type of methodology, it, it's good. You know, that's not going to be something that's going to be standard just because you're looking at something that's really kind of unknown. Um, so looking for those unknown type of compounds, you're going to have to kind of look at multiple avenues with different, a lot of different kind of techniques. Uh, you know, the place really to start would be uh, maybe Definitely, you're going to have to do LCMS work just because uh, you're going to need mass spec information as far as trying to back, kind of decipher or, or uh, what is what is actually going on and what compounds are present. So, not a very clear-cut standard way um, to proceed in that, but uh, it's it's definitely an interesting, you know, uh, interesting challenge. Okay, uh, question from Dale. Have you quantified or studied how the relative concentrations of the various monomers and oligomers change over time from application through curing and potential off-gassing days or weeks later? Uh, no, I haven't. That would actually be uh, another great ex uh, experiment to run and a lot of great information. Um, and that's one of the things that, that really kind of interests me at this point uh, that we may be investigating is is a lot of the kinetics as far as what is going on and how, or essentially like how soon, it'd be kind of determining or getting the answer as far as how soon something would be safe versus, you know, any exposure like that. And then obviously if you have a large enough Say if you have a large enough particle or a large particle of material that was created, polymerization, you know, occurs on the surface, would occur on the surface as if it just stood in, in, in the environment. Um, isocyanates react very well with uh, water, moisture in the air. So you're going to get some polymerization kind of coating it. It's almost like, you know, creating, you're, you're going to polymerize from outside to inside. Um, and having to see how fast that would actually take for some of these isocyanates it, with a large enough particle, how fast does that occur? And how soon would something like that, you know, could you go into an environment and clean something like that up? Because um, a lot of times in applications, you know, with 
the generation of all these aerosols, um, how, you know, cleaning up, you know, when can somebody come into that environment? And, and if you do a cleanup, how soon can you go in there and clean up with, with you know, certain levels of PPE or, but that would, you know, that would definitely be a great, great investigation study to do. Uh, Jordan asks, could you please describe the process of sample prep and extraction for the acid sampler? Um, kind of, it's it's a multi-step procedure. Um, you're basically what you're doing is you're you're taking the filters out of this out of the sampler. There's two filters in the one in the denuder and one in the uh, cassette filter that kind of sits at the bottom of it, which is the, for the particles. You, those are taken out. Those are extracted with toluene. Um, there is actually, you know, at certain points you can add your internal standards, um, but you're basically doing a, a toluene extraction and then you have a, a solvent um, transfer into what would be compatible with your system, so acetonitrile, uh, so, but it, it takes a little bit of time just because you're working with toluene, and, and the extraction, because you're, I mean, you need to actually get, since you're doing a solvent exchange, basically, you need to get rid of a lot of toluene, um, so that is uh, kind of like the slow choke point of the whole process. So that's why somebody asked earlier about why we had two acid samplers, you know, sitting next to each other. And um, and as explained that one, we actually took a look at using, changing that methodology and moving it over to a hexane extraction. And obviously with hexane, you can actually do that uh, sample prep a lot faster. Okay. Um, Marvin asked, have the two sampling methods been compared in higher exposure environments, such as during spray foam application? Um, we are actually looking into that and performing some testing. Um, we are kind of in the preliminary stages of, of getting that set up, and uh, uh, but we're also looking at looking at in doing a comparison, not only just with um, cassette style samplers, but actually with impinger samples too. Okay. Uh, another question, from your experience, how critical is the field absorption? Is there any comparison on percent difference with or without absorption? Um, there is actually. Um, we, uh, one of the other, one another study that I've taken a look at is actually I've looked at um, using the Orbo 80 or these cassette or cassette style samplers, and run some samples, and run kind of a time um, time delay in the field absorption step, um, and there is you we do see I, I did see a um, decrease in the amount of material that was um, recovered. Okay. Um, Adamola asks, how long are samples stable for prior to analysis? Are there any specific considerations to be aware of? Um, for, if we're talking cassettes style, like, an, like the Orbo 80, um, you'd, you'd have to you know, definitely field absorb them. Um, after those are field absorbed, stability-wise for those are, you know, typically you want to analyze them within the week. Um, for the acid style samplers, uh, you, those don't need to be field absorbed. Those can go. Um, you can probably take a month before you ever need to analyze them. Okay. Uh, Arnold has a few questions. Uh, what is the minimum and maximum sample volume? Can flow rate be varied and are volumes dependent on anticipated concentrations? Um, there's no real uh, set flow rate, but flow rate does affect um, how much the way that, the, that an acid sampler performs, just because you remember that it's 
it contains a volatile derivation reagent. I mean, and I don't say, when I say volatile, I don't mean, you know, uh, volatile like you leave it out on the table, you know, a drop of it out on the table. It's gone within a few minutes. Um, it, the volatility is not very high, but it's high enough where you can actually, where it does replenish given the air volume that moves through them. Now, we did the sampling um, at 100 mils per minute, and obviously, you know, you can run a little bit higher or, than that, but but we haven't taken a look at, you know, if we ran it at, say we tried to run it at a, a liter per minute, we haven't looked at how well or how effective it is that, but, but having the way that it's designed gives you the ability to run eight hours. And so dependent upon the concentration, I mean, obviously, the higher the concentration that the environment, um, you don't want to be running any type of sampler past its, its kind of capacity. So you would actually, you know, for a higher concentration environment, you'd run a, a lower, you know, obviously you try to pull a lower sample. So if you have no idea as far as the concentration that is in the environment, you can run two acid samplers side by side, you can, or two filter cassettes side by side, or any type of sampling um, uh, sampler, and you run one at a higher flow rate and one at a lower flow rate, or you, or you run them both at the same time, but you run one for, you know, two hours versus four hours or five hours kind of deal. Um, that way you have your bases covered. That way, you know, again, if for the IH industry and as a IH consultant, you know, you go into a facility, you don't want to have to go back there multiple times just to pull one sample. So if you go there knowing or not knowing what the possibilities are, if you can cover all those possibilities in that same period, you're only there for one time and employers and employees kind of have a better uh, feel for that. Okay. Uh, another attendee uh, says, you mentioned thermal degradation with polyurethanes. Would you see the same potential isocyanate exposure to sanding or grinding a cured pa painted surface? I would, I would expect so. I definitely would expect so. Okay. Um, Thomas asks, what qualifications must the test administrator have, if any? Um, not, I mean, if they're versed in, in IH sampling, that's pretty much all they really need. It's, there's nothing okay. complicated with, the, with, you know, using the sampler. Okay. Uh, question from Carl. How did the Urbo and Asset methods compare in terms of percent recovery of the same HDI standard? Well, the recoveries were, I mean, it's hard to, to t tell about the recoveries just because the, the standards that are used, now the Orbo and versus the Asset, they use different derivatization reagents. So the derivatives standards are going to be different, although they did um, so the the recoveries the recoveries are are going to be uh, it's well for the Orbo eighty it's it's hard to put a recovery value on when we didn't get any detectable amount in the air in the personal sample um, but uh, the internal standards for the assets I mean they're all within acceptable limits. Okay. Uh, Gary, thanks for, uh, for sticking in with all those questions. We've reached the top of the hour. Um, I'm sorry to our attendees if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, but they will all be provided to Gary, and uh, he can follow up with you, or you can reach out to him through his, uh, through his email address, um, which uh, was chatted out earlier today. Um, Thank you, Gary, for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank the Sepelco Division of Sigma Aldrich for sponsoring today's webinar, and I'd like to thank all of our listeners today. This is our last Synergist webinar for the year, but we're planning more events for 2016, and I hope you can join us then. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a happy holiday season and best wishes, best wishes for the new year. Have a great day.